So hello, COVID crazy people. Hopefully you are safe and warm. I'm talking to you from Atlanta, Georgia, the future home of Snowmageddon. We're supposed to get snow on Sunday, which makes Atlanta just totally nuts. So uh, when we're done with the lectures today, I got to go out and find some milk or paper towels or something like that because people think they're going to be covered in snow for like weeks. So with that being said, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Um, and I gotta get the right button here. I don't know why that's not going. There we go. All right, so why are we here? I know, I know we're here to get CE. I know we're here for um, uh, hopefully a lot of great learning that you can apply for your practices. But you know what? The reason why I'm in dentistry is because of this person right here. That's my mom. And that is yours truly down there. And um, my mom was very fearful about going to the dentist. Um, when we moved to Florida, she had her mouth redone. And I didn't know why, didn't really have a clue about what was going on. I just knew that for a long time, she didn't smile. And as a precocious eight, nine-year-old, I started to wonder maybe it was about me, you know, maybe it was about my brother that we fought all the time or whatever it was. And then finally, when her dentistry was done, uh, she suddenly started to smile again. She was becoming the life of the party again. She would come to my ball games. Uh, she was not antisocial. And uh, after learning that I was not going to be the fifth Beatle, and I decided that I didn't want to be an astronaut. Dentistry actually sounded like a really good gig. And that led me to uh, jump in. And actually, that's how I went to Emory. That's how I met Lou years ago. And uh, the rest is history. And that, that's my why. And, you know, to be honest with you, uh, and I don't know if anybody's read this book, uh, I would highly recommend you at least watch Simon Sinek's video on YouTube about this. You know, why do you get up in the morning? Why do you go to work? I, I, I hope it's not about, why well, I need a paycheck or anything like that. That would be a lot of drudgery. And I think we all know, I can't tell you what your why is. I think we're here because we want to be educated and we have an idea what the result is. And I think many of us sometimes are confused about how to connect the dots between the why and the what. How do we get there? Um, what are the techniques and, and so forth? So hopefully you're gonna learn a lot of that today. And you're going to feel like uh, your time with me, Lou and Ron and Peter is going to be totally worth it. So what I, I learned in dental school was kind of this, the step-by-step -step ways of doing things. Um, you think of the way things have shifted in dentistry in terms of doing cosmetic dentistry, in terms of doing, uh, you know, gum treatment, even, even ortho, uh, even dentures. I mean, there's a lot of people that get dentures, but we do a lot of teeth in a day in our practice. I mean, the world has changed quite a bit. So hopefully you're going to learn some things from me today that will help streamline some of your systems uh, so that your patients and your team will succeed even more. So um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, really an efficient, easy way to use a cement that I consider a Swiss Army knife that can be used for all different kinds of indirect restorations in situations that I think uh, can be extremely challenging, not just the everyday bread and butter stuff. Sometimes you get some crazy stuff that happens. So I'll say, show you a case with that. Um, I've been using lasers, um, God, almost, let's see, about 19 years. Now. And I think Ron's been using them even longer than I have. Um, that, that is just bread and butter for what we do. And I'll show you some things that we're doing. And then the other thing I'm gonna do is maybe give you some tips on, because I do a lot of cosmetic dentistry, how do I make it easy or to do veneer cases and uh, cosmetic cases? So not only do you don't have failures in treatment in terms of the clinical part, but the failures and things that go on, you know, in people's brains, everything above the nose so that you can manage people's expectations. So uh, a few disclosures, uh, when I was uh, president-elect of the AACD, we came up with the term responsible aesthetics, 
uh, not cutting down teeth, that cosmetic dentistry had a bad reputation 10 to 15 years ago. So um, that was one of the great things. I do a lot of things, I would say on the leading edge, not so much the bleeding edge. I mean, I, I, I push the envelope on things, but I also like to use tried and, tried and true proven technologies as well. I'm gonna mention a lot of different products, things that are uh, used for me. I'm a wet fingered real world dentist and um, um, I, I don't work for any particular companies. I just tell it, tell it like it is. Uh, but GC is sponsoring me today. GC has been a fabulous company uh, to work with they have incredible products. And then uh, I'll share a few things that um, not only that I'll use, but you know, I might learn a few things from my fellow co colleagues here while we're doing our presentation today. And I may learn some things for you. Feel free to ask questions. And sometimes I, I might learn from you as well. Know what I'm saying? And I do mention bad jokes and movie references a lot. So uh, I've had the privilege of traveling some pretty cool places. These are some pictures from when I was in New Zealand, when I lectured there. But I'm, I'm a homeboy I and I, I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm a huge music fan. And other than um, seeing Otis Redding, I've seen all these musicians and uh, I, I've been extremely, extremely lucky to do that. But uh, so Georgia is my home and Georgia is also home for some incredible traffic jams. And, but it's also home for one of my great mentors, Dr. Ronnie Goldstein, who um, mentored me even when I was in dental school, we had a senior elective and just the light bulb went off in my head that that's what I wanted to do. So I got, I got a lot of clarity about my future. But fortunately for me, I've also developed some other mentors along the way. One is the great Jerry Sheesh, who uh, has since retired from Medical College of Georgia. And, uh, but I wouldn't be here without um, my, my team. I, my, I kiddingly call myself Hugh Flax in the Teeth Street Band. And uh, my team really does a lot of the work in the office and I'm very grateful for them. Um, so this is my, it was my new uh, office. Uh, I'm still paying for it after five years, but um, it's a great place to work. We get to these incredible views outside my window and it's just very spacious and a lot of fun. And this is my, uh, I have two daughters that I know of and I'm, I'm winking, it's not really true. I have two daughters and this is my third one, my puppy Josie. So let's talk about some challenges that we're dealing with in dentistry. One of the things that has kind of fallen on me is that I am a uh, leader in this profession and aesthetics, you know, the rules haven't changed that much. The, the rules of biology and bone strength hasn't changed. Function has changed. We used to think that external stresses with, um, with, uh, let's say uh, trying to keep up with Joneses or work, you know, work, home life, things like that. Uh, but, you know, now uh, the last couple of years has been a little bit cuckoo crazy. So politics have creeped into it uh, at a exponential uh, time. And, uh, but we also learned there's also internal stresses. The, what, the things that we eat um, make a huge difference in how uh, we sleep at night, how we clench our teeth. We have patients that uh, come to us that are under a lot of stress and they're taking Wellbutrin and they're crushing their teeth all the time. So those medications, but you know, bottom line, uh, we've got uh, a lot of issues that keep us up at night. Sometimes it's just not what we worry about. Sometimes it's some physical things. So there's a real triad of things that are going on that are um, affecting us, not just the typical occlusal things in TMJ, but also there's the skeletal things, the head and neck, the things that uh, we thought we weren't gonna be using in school, kind of like the Krebs cycle, right? But you know, one of the things that really is a challenge these days is, is the uh, economics. Uh, patients have ridiculous some expectations sometimes and um, you know, they, they, they're so media driven sometimes and sometimes they want, they, they have a smile that could be, you could give it a D grade and, um, and they expect an A plus. And we, I just have to be realistic with people. 
Uh, but you know, we have challenges with chair time. We have challenges with staff to help manage that chair time. That we're all going through that right now. We want to be minimally invasive. Our patients want us to be that way. We they want us to be affordable and have stuff that durable that lasts forever if possible. And then there's this thing that's creeping in, unfortunately, in our profession. These things called DSOs. And um, so we won't get into the politics of that. But um, I hope every but he's able to uh, manage through all these things. But one of the other challenges that we're dealing with is we got new materials. And with these newer materials, it used to be when I was in dental school, it's just PFG crowns, that was it. But now we're dealing with all these different variabilities that affect what we use for cementation. There's um, retentive preps, non-retentive preps. What's the preparation like? Um, are we dealing with enamel? Are we dealing with dentin? Uh, what are the materials that we're using? Are we using zirconia, ceramics, uh, composites? Um, and then if you're using zirconia, you can't get that light through there. So how do you know it's guaranteed that you're going to get a really great bond there? And then the other thing that we're dealing with is not only staff turnover, we're also dealing with training because they have to understand what you're dealing with. Uh, I, I like them to have everything ready when I come in the room. So. Um, We've built systems as, as this evolution has taken place with materials that they understand what's, what, what's going on. And also at the same time, we want to have things that are have ease of use and we can be efficient as possible. So um, <laughs> a little of technology. There we go. So a few years ago, uh, when I was at the Koi Center, I created this uh, template for how to manage materials. And, um, you know, of course, we've got lithium to silicate, zirconia, and metal. And you've got anything that you're using for cementation, you've got to create some type of um, change in the surface of that material, whether you're using phosphoric acid, whether you're using uh, air, air abrasion, that will help improve the retention of your materials. So that, those are key things to do. And then you've got to be able to treat the tooth and then you got to pick out the right cement. So it's like, you think you're confused about what's going on in the world. Like imagine what it's like for, for staff that have very, very little training, have never been in an office like yours, how to manage these type of things. So um, what we have um, done is implemented that into our system and made it easier for people to do their dentistry. And, you know, I, I get a lot of, I get bombarded with a lot of different materials that say, hey, doc, would you like to use this material? I like to keep it simple. I only like, I, I really prefer using materials that I know the companies really, really well. I'm not going to be like the Wiley Coyote and pick Acme cement or anything like that. So these are choices. If you want to take a picture of, of this shot, you're welcome to. Um, these are only my recommendations, but when you have short preps, you want to have something that's obviously adhesive. And then when you have longer preps, you want to have something that will bond, but actually can feed and remineralize the tooth as well. And so we've got some really great choices that are out there. So in order to really succeed in this world, and it's very similar to some of the things that a lot of people like, um, Peter Drucker said that um, you got to leverage your time, you got to be innovative, always, always got to be innovating, and then you've got to be creative along the way. And I'm, I'm lucky that my East Teeth Street band allows me to do that. And actually, they're, they, they contribute a lot to it. We've got a very synergistic team, and I'm, I'm, I'm feel very blessed. And as, as Steve Jobs said, if you're innovative, it really distinguishes you whether you're going to be a leader or you're going to be a sheep and following along. And that's never been my, my, my gig at all. And um, it's really helped me succeed through this. I don't know why that slide is back up. So what the heck do you do when you got a patient that's from out of town and they call you and say, oh, my crown's off. Can you re-cement it? And then you see something like this. Well, I'm going to show you how in just a little bit and it makes it easy peasy to do it. So, uh, so just stay tuned here, okay? So we as dentists have a wish list. Uh, besides having 
you know, reliable staff and nobody getting COVID. These are our wish lists that in terms of cements that we have something that's optimal for retention and all different types of, of um, preparations. You want something that is universally can be used for all different situations in terms of the substrates of materials that you're using and also whether it's enamel or dentin. And you want it almost, I wouldn't say brain free, you don't have to think, but you can have some flexibility in terms of treatment that um, uh, you can succeed if, gee, you know, oh my God, did I dry the tooth off too much? I mean, we used to think about that stuff when we were originally getting into bonding. Uh, now there's things that make it a little bit easier for you and you don't have that big chip on your shoulder to worry about that stuff. And you wanna have something that looks great, the margins are sealed up nicely so you get a beautiful aesthetic outcome. And of course, when you can have the fewer cements that you can have, you have reduced inventory, it decreases the confusion by your staff and you can have optimized workflows. So um, guess what? There's a Swiss army knife right here. It's called GSEM-1. And um, it's a dual cure self-adhesive cement extremely strong bond strengths. And uh, when it says optional tooth primer, I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, according to the research, you don't have to use this. I use it for everything. If it's like anything, if I could find something that I knew would take five strokes off my golf game, I would use it. This material, the, the uh, primer, I don't think is optional. I just love using it. And in my staff just doesn't have, gee, doctor, you use this or not. So it's a very simple solution for all the day-to-day -day procedures. And I think there's some pros and cons. I'll, I'll talk to you about a case at the end that um, I think GC, GSEM, or excuse me, GC is, is coming up with a solution to this. So we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So the beauty of, of GSEM one is it's extremely um, universal. It can be used for all different substrates. And the ones that I had the biggest concerns with is when I'm, cause I use lithium disilicate and zirconia pretty much all the time in the practice. So um, it's extremely, extremely strong. I don't have to worry about what material I'm using. Um, and it makes things, uh, as I said, easier for my staff. And this is the secret sauce uh, that um, we use that quote unquote optional thing. This is an accelerator that's easy to use. All you've got to do is um, after you've kind of treated the tooth and we'll go over the technique in a little bit and you paint this on there, you don't have to, you, you paint it on there for maybe 10 seconds, you dry it off, make sure it doesn't pull and you don't have to cure it. You don't even have to etch when you use this. So uh, and it's incredibly useful. Uh, it's, it, it's a slam dunk. That's, that's the way I feel about it. You, you look at this chart right here and when you've got something that is paralleling, here's GCM1, and you're paralleling Panavia um, and outdoing Panavia in, in some situations, uh, I, I'm just loving that type of stuff. And um, so this is where that A, AEP, almost said AEPI, Lou, but it had a, a, a adhesive adv enhancing primer is absolutely not optional, I think it, you've got to use this stuff. So it, and um, there's, there's always an issue with patients, uh, especially your cementing zirconia in, in the back of the mouth, where you've got some patients that just have uh, saliva issues. It's like for once when you're cementing a, a crown, it'd be nice if everybody just had dry mouth for just um, maybe a few minutes. But that's not always the case. But according to studies that were do, done in, in Japan uh, back in 2019, GSM-1, when you use the AEP, helps you overcome uh, some of the challenges you have with saliva. That doesn't mean you can just let the tooth soak in saliva. You still got to use the best technique. But if you got a little bit of saliva on that, it doesn't seem like it's a deal killer. So that gives you another, just another safety net for this technique. So let's just talk a little bit about the technique. Of course, the, the, the most simple thing, and, and this is like a little checklist with my team, 
they always know before you put the tip in that you purge it. Um, and we're not talking about the purge the movie, we're talking about purging your, um, um, your dispenser just a little bit so there's no, you, you know you're gonna get a clean, uh, consistent mix in there. And then, um, then it, as you're planning this out, you, you just have to think, okay, when I have a retentive preparation, do and what type of material I'm using. So if you have a retentive preparation, uh, you um, want to, or a non-retentive preparation, they're recommending that you use the AEP all the time. Um, and my feeling is whether it's retentive or not retentive, I just, you, I, I've said this too many times, AEP is just a, 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 a just that extra sense of security for me. And it's like, it's, it's really no big deal to use it. So um, there's a product that GC has that you use on ceramics and uh, composites or hybrid and hybrid ceramics called multi-primer. You use it on that, that's it. You don't use it on metal. You don't use it on zirconia. As a matter of fact, in zirconia, you've got to use a product that has MDP on it. And um, I, I use a product I'll show you in just a little bit for that. So step-by-step, step, very, very simple. Of course, you clean the tooth, you isolate it. Um, in my technique, I not only use just water, I also use consepsis and also put um, gluma on there just to decrease any chances of sensitivity. You know, anything I can do to make, make sure I get a slam dunk is great. So then when you place the AEP on there, um, very simply, you paint it on there, couple, I, I do a couple strokes of it, wait 10 seconds and then dry it for five seconds, make sure it doesn't pull up. And then very simply after, and I do the restoration, my assistants do the uh, restoration repair or prepare preparation before we prepare the tooth. And then we put the cement in there and then you extrude it into the restoration, you seed it. And I like to, um, they don't show this here. I like to have my patients close down or my assistants will hold it down. But if they close it down and then I check the occlusion, make sure it still feels nice. Then I have them close down on that cotton roll. We cure the facial, maybe one to two seconds. And then I peel off the excess, um, while it's in, while it's curing, while because it is self curing, and then I go ahead to the lingual, I peel off, the, do the curing, and then I peel off the lingual, clear the cement because this stuff, if it gets stuck between your teeth, it's a, it's a double time to clean up. So I do all that cleaning, and then we go ahead and do our final curing, and we instruct our patients to avoid chewing over there for the rest of the day. You know, I said. It's 90% hard when you're, when you're leaving, give it another 24 hours. And then they don't have, I tell them not to floss there because I've done all the flossing. And um, then I know that it gets full cure and it's a slam dunk. So I'm not worried uh, that under zirconia, my cement's not hardening up. It's, it's a guaranteed situation because it's self curing. So let's, let's show you a, a typical case. So this gentleman came in to see me. He's a, a neurologist and his wife, I'm, I'm doing cosmetic dentistry for him. And he had some dental work done um, that really wasn't so great. And you can see the margins up here and he's got these big amalgams. He's got corrosion over here and over here. So we have just diligently, diligently been cleaning up his mouth. And while we, um, when, when we went ahead and prepared the lower left, we of course tried everything in, got a good seat here with these restorations. And then we went ahead and uh, prepared our restoration uh, with the uh, air abrasion with the aluminum oxide. And you don't want it too close. I, I usually hold it about five to six millimeters away and not too much pressure with my prep start. And then this is what I use that, that has MDP Z prime from Bisco. Uh, 
very, very nice product. We paint it on there, leave it on there for about 10 seconds. That's really all you need to do. And then you dry it and then my assistants just uh, cover it so no uh, air gets to it. And then we go ahead through our process of, um, of cementation. So as I said before, I clean the prep, I isolate, I use the consepsis and the galuma, and then we paint the AEP on there, as I said, for 10 seconds, and then dry it for five, put the GSM-1 in there, and in the back of the mouth, I, I have to use the opaque material. I, and zirconia, I mean, really, who cares? It's not gonna affect the aesthetics. Uh, it's just easier to clean up. Uh, I'm, I, I would be embarrassed that I left any cement in somebody's mouth. Um, and so that's what we like to use, but they, oh, there's also a translucent one. I'll show you a case where I did that. And then um, again, like I said, I had the patients close down the cotton roll and then we cure the cement. This peels off really, really easy. Um, and that's one of the beauties. It, it, it's really shocking to me, you know, how easy this stuff is for somebody who's trained on zinc phosphate back in dental school. So, um, and it's just extremely reliable. So here's that emergency case I had. Patient comes to me, um, uh, her sister is a patient of mine and uh, she's visiting and she bit on something really hard and fractured her crown. And um, she's a very attractive woman and wasn't interested in uh, going to the trailer park for her vacation. So there she is. And uh, so Jenny said, I, I don't have time to do all this. She really needed ortho and a lot of other things. She wanted to go back home and do those things, but she wanted to get in and out. And so, um, you know, what do you do? I mean, there's not a lot of cements that have the strength. I mean, you could use maybe a buildup material to do that, but then you got to etch, you got to do all this other stuff. When you have something that simplifies things, it makes all the difference in the world. And you can see, here's her crown. And God bless, she was able to find that crown. And the other thing is that when we tried it in, it actually on the lingual felt really good. So I had something to index to. So you can see on the x-ray, she fractures the post. I'm not interested in trying to take any posts out. Um, I'm not interested in getting and joining the Coast Guard or anything. I'm just interested in helping my patient as reliably as I can within my own skill sets. So um, what we did was choose the GSEM cement. So very simply, we, I, we were able to fit the crown together with this tooth. And what I did was just paint this tooth with AP, and then we went ahead and painted the crown with the GSEM one. And, on, and as well as on here, so I knew I had a plenty of cement, got a really good seat, actually had her closed down to make sure the occlusion's right, because I really don't want to be adjusting her occlusion. Uh, and then because it fractured on the facial, I had to use some uh, opaque genial bond to kind of make this look more attractive here so that she didn't have this gray spot on her tooth. I mean, she was glad she had a tooth, but I wanted her to look as attractive as possible so that that whole thing took us um, maybe a half hour of our time. Um, and uh, it turned out to be really great. Her sister was extremely happy that her sister was happy. Your sister's a bit high maintenance as it is. And uh, she went home and hopefully she's, she's gonna move forward with doing some ortho so she can take the uh, stresses off that tooth. We'll see. So when we're dealing with dentistry, I like to look at it as, I'm, I grew up on Colombo, but of course, CSI is the more common thing to look at as crime scene investigations. And so data acquisition is extremely key. So you want it to be accurate, you want it to be calibrated and systematic. But at the same time, I, I learned this from John Coyce that you, you gotta really look at things very similar to a Rubik's cube. And all the colors of the Rubik's Cube, if you're gonna figure it out, you know that all the colors gotta match up. How do you 
um, make this very much like ideal treatment planning. And, and it's a great analogy. I love to give my patients, my staff understands this as well, because each of, these co each of the colors symbolizes the risks that we deal in dentistry on a daily basis. Uh, what are the strengths, how's the strength of the teeth like we had in that last case? Uh, what's the perio support? What's the bone or excuse me, the occlusal function here? What are the patient's daily habits? Uh, do they drink Red Bull? Um, do they floss their teeth? All, all these things are extremely important. What's their medical management? Well, how old they are? They're all people are on Wellbutrin or on all these medications. Our populations become uh, rather addicted to different, a lot of medications these days. And then ultimately, what's the aesthetics like? So um, they're all important. Um, I mean, people come to me about the aesthetics, but to be honest with you, I think about all these things. And if someone doesn't want to manage any of those things, I just say, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't help you. I, I've made those mistakes too much in my, in my career. Um, I'm not, not willing to do that anymore. So when you figure out that Rubik's Cube, everything matches and everything's uh, hunky-dory and the patients are happy in the long run. And uh, I have a lot fewer uh, hassles in my life. So look at this case here. It's a patient of mine who worked for Coca-Cola. And um, when she lived and grew up in South Georgia, um, she ground her teeth and it got to the point where she was embarrassed with her smile. She's a career woman. Life at Coca-Cola can be very competitive. And uh, she wanted me to help her out. So when you look at a smile like this, this is what I call high risk. When, you see, when the curtain goes up, when the lips go up, and you see not only the teeth, you see the gums, and you see a lot of back teeth in the, in the buccal corridor, everything has to look great. You really can't cut corners on this. And, and these are things I share with my patients because the more they know that you're being thoughtful about their treatment plan and you're not, uh, and you show yourself you're the authority and the expert, but you're making them a, a collaborative partner in this, they really, really appreciate that. So you're looking at this, instead of the teeth being 75 to 80% width to length ratio, they're actually wider than they are long. And you wonder what the heck happened here? And look at the wear. And typically when people have wear in the front, you think, oh, it's constricted occlusion. But here's the deceptive thing here. She got the she and she got the crown of the of the year based on what her insurance did all these years. So, yes, the the other dentist kept those back teeth from breaking down. Unfortunately, either because they didn't know how to do it, or they didn't have the we'll call it confrontational tolerance to be honest with the patient. Say, hey, Houston, I'm seeing we have a problem here. Um, and uh, but that patient came to me. She understood that we had to rebuild her mouth and. Um, fortunately, her occlusion uh, was not compromised by um, a lack of bone support. So that made things a lot easier for us to restore this case. And you look here, obviously the buccal corridor had to be improved. Her midline was a bit off. Uh, and because the canine wasn't showing very well, it was a clue that we needed to open up the bite. And that's been, you know, Frank Spear, John Coyce, uh, Carl Mish have talked about that in their uh, research and studies for a long, long time. So we opened up her bite. I, I put her in a deprogrammer. We found out what her CR was and our lab went, um, went ahead and opened up the bite. I usually like to do the front 20 and then do the molars later on. Once I've got some stable occlusion, I got a tripod of healthy joints and I've got a tripod of good anterior guidance in the front. Then I know I'm stable. And many of you have been looking, maybe looking at this wax up and say, well, what are all those numbers there? Well, the lab that I use on this case uh, understood that I use a laser. I'm not Dr. Evil, but I love my freaking laser. And um, I've been using lasers for about 19 years now. And I do gum lifts because I wanted that to those teeth to look as natural as possible. So I did a mock-up and one of the things I did uh, before I prepped the case is I kept this tooth here, my central incisor, so I knew I had the right uh, width to length ratio here. 
And what I did with that is use as a template to plan out how I was going to sculpt my gums. And I wanna see a nice geometric progression from the front to the back. We won't go into all those aesthetic details and um, use a stick bite to make sure that it's level with the horizontal plane because when a patient like her smiles, she doesn't, you wanna see her gums look tilted and have a nice incisal edge position. So it's a little tip I learned many, many years ago. So we went ahead with uh, my laser and just sculpted the gum tissue. And as you can see right here, we had a nice geometric progression from the front to the back. And then I did both sides. And here I sculpted the gums. And then we went ahead and prepped the teeth. And you know, when you're opening the bite, you want to create a cingulum in the back. So on the upper teeth, as much as I would love doing veneers, she needed a lot more than that. We, we uh, did crowns on the uppers and then veneers on the lowers. And, um, and then when we uh, made our temporaries, I cemented the upper temporaries with um, GSEM Temp Advantage. I love this product, very, very easy to use. So much, it, I mean, I'm not gonna rag on anybody's products. This thing works great. I've been using it for a long, long time. So you cement it. And then when I cement the, the temporaries, I know what my gingival margin is. I know where, uh, because I know the aesthetics. And then that's when I do my closed flap osseous uh, preparation, kind of like taking this tip like a perio probe and adjusted that uh, bone and uh, gum here. So uh, at the same time, that's worked well for me for many years. My patient looks fabulous. This is her at her temp check. And she's so excited about this, not worrying that uh, her smile is gonna be compromised because she's going on a cruise while the lab is making the porcelain for us. And she's so excited about this. She actually wants the lab to wax up the back teeth because as soon as we put the front 20 in, she wants the molars done. So when I'm doing my bonding, this is something I learned from John Coyce. I actually learned it when I was in uh, Japan as well that you can prove the bond strength on teeth dramatically by using air abrasion. According to statistics, you can improve the bond strength almost 25%. That's like taking five to 10 strokes off your golf game. So, uh, and it's a great product to use, easy to use, but you know, it's also important to use the right products for a great bond as well. You don't want to use Acme, you want to use something from a proven company. That's why I, I love companies like GC and you want to use a universal um, uh, bonding agent, and I'll explain. But you want to, it can be used for all different kinds of preparations and um, uh, abutments. Uh, when you're using ceramics, you got to use this product. It's kind of like your silane uh, in a way, so it, it, it get, helps that bond strength with the porcelain. And um, then you want to use a cement that's really great. So. Uh, Currently, I use Link Force uh, on my anterior cases. They have all different shades. It's easy to clean up, very similar to what uh, I use with GCM1. And um, the, the beauty of, of universal bonding, I mean, there are a lot of different ones out there. You can use it for direct and indirect restorations. You don't have to paint two different layers of materials. It's, it's very compatible with all different systems and it, it just makes life a whole lot easier. So again, I use my air abrasion on the preps and uh, use conception after my air abrasion, etch the enamel and I, I etch the dent to be honest with you, thoroughly rinse it. And then I paint my universal bonding material on there. And the great thing about these universal bonding materials is you can cure them before you put the restoration on. And you see that shiny surface on there. Yeah. Oh my, oh my God. It just, you, you know, that material is going to stay on there. You're not going to get leakage on, on those teeth. So it just, uh, people invest a lot of money in their smiles. They trust me to do it right. So it gives me peace of mind, gives my patients peace of mind. And I tell them I do all these things as well. So we cure it for 10 seconds. And then I'm, I'm using, um, my, I, I, I use the link force for the anterior teeth. And then on the back, um, on my uh, zirconia, I'm using the GSM-1 again. And then uh, sometimes you have to make adjustments. 
and uh, I I still use paper, but when I do a big case, I use um, my um, uh, I use my digital T scan to check the timing, the balance, and I also use it for documentation because when someone says, "Well, my bite was never right," well, so I can show them that the bite was right, and maybe they stop wearing their bite guard or they. Uh, I, I think a equilibration is a beautiful thing to do for people because you give them that sixth sense that, hey, something doesn't feel right. And when I can use this type of technology, it makes life a lot easier. So here's my patient when we finished. And you can see just the occlusion looks great. Um, and here's all her before and after. So we su succeeded in, quote unquote, solving the Rubik's Cube. So, um, Peter, I'm just going to take just a few more minutes here, and then I can wind down for some Q&A, okay? Um, so, here's a patient of mine referred to me by a, a patient who is a uh, PR guru, and um, Emily Foley is uh, what we'll call an influencer, and as pretty as she is and as much work as she does on video, she hated her smile. She was a dental assistant one time and she had white spots on her teeth and her dentist did bonding on her I don't know, 15, 20 years ago. And it stained, it chipped um, and she just was embarrassed. But she found a way like everybody does with their selfies of maybe holding that camera, or angling your head so nobody noticed. So it really bothered her and she's doing a lot of stuff uh, in media, doing something on uh, a few TV shows now, and she wanted to look her best. So um, when we can look at her profile, I mean, this the, the canines didn't look natural. There wasn't that geometric progression that I spoke about earlier. So um, there's, there's a product that we're using in our practice to kind of open people's eyes of what's possible, kind of like with Invisalign. Uh, if you're using Itero, you can show for people very easily. This is something my staff does for me. Um, in five minutes, they can do imaging on somebody that at least opens people's eyes to what's possible. So wonderful, wonderful product. And then if they say, hey, I'm really interested and if it looks like it's gonna be a case like Emily's where she's gonna want at least 10 to 12 veneers, um, I'm gonna use Exican. I've gotten a lot more digital over the years and I'm on my third scanner as a matter of fact. Um, so I use Exacad and then I create a model from that because she had some bulky restorations. I couldn't like create a, um, uh, a um, print an overlay. I, I had to print a model and then we used uh, a putty matrix and we did this mock-up for her. And she said, wow, that looks a whole lot better. And she's extremely picky, which is fine with me. Uh, and she says, I, I like this, but here's some few changes on it we're having a conversation. That's the most important thing. It's not about closing a deal. It's about having a conversation, building that bond of trust so that people want to move forward. So um, to have, you know, a mock-up is nice, but we, I want a functional wax up. So my lab technician, uh, MJ Shin in Dallas, uh, created this for me. Um, there was a few things that Emily and I both noticed that we want to open the embrasures up. She wanted her teeth to look very individualized. So we did that uh, in while we did her case. Uh, I can't help it when, but when I see gum tissue that needs to be touched up, all I do, I gotta do is pull out my laser and just trim it. Very conservative preparations. We're doing veneers here. And then I use a putty matrix just to make sure I've got enough thickness here. Um, and then we, we always, you know, I bring my patients back for temp checks. I would rather let them test drive it in terms of not just the aesthetics, but also in terms of the function as well. So you can see as Emily gave me a lot of feedback, usually those appointments are one hour with, with her, it was like two hours, but I, I, I was cool with it. And one thing I noticed, I mean, I'm using uh, the bleach shade of Lux, Lux attempt here and when you look close up, it's still not bright enough. She wanted that media smile and um, it looks okay here, but I'm seeing a little shine through. I'm very conservative with it. 
So I told MJ, we need to improve the opacity on the ingot. We use, when we're using Lisi Press, I love Lisi Press, it looks extremely natural. So we send all this information off to MJ and she kind of builds everything up, builds colors in there. And you can't, you know, with, with the BL1, you can't do too much translucency because it looks fake, but um, it really, really looked great. You can see how conservative we were, preserved a lot of two structure. And then with um, the um, very, uh, excuse me, the link force, they have a try and paste. And then again, this is very similar to any of the other products that are on the market. Um, I treat the porcelain with um, the, um, the primer. And then um, I know deep down that the research that at GC says not to etch. Um, this is not a case where I, I felt comfortable with not etching, we had, we're all in enamel. I want to get that extra measure of improvement. But one of the things we're using a dual cure material, it's not light cured where you can just tack and put them in uh, you know, all at once. So in this particular case, what I did in, is, and this, the, the, uh, there's a learning lesson here, is I put the A, E, uh, I etched eight, nine, and then I went ahead and put the AEP on that. And then I went ahead and uh, put the cement, clean that all off. Very, it's very easy to clean up, flossed it, then went to seven and 10 with the same technique and went like that. It took a little bit longer. I just want to see how this product worked. I knew the limitations that it was a dual cure material. So I, I didn't have all the time in the world. Uh, the clock was ticking and I, I'm just not that fast. I didn't think that would have been unrealistic. And um, so we did that technique and here's her after, like a whole different person. And uh, she's extremely grateful for this. Just look at her um, before and after close up. And this is something she posted here that um, her upgrades uh, you can see this here at the bottom that her upgrades um, make it make her look great at every angle and, and that's absolutely true. So with that being said, the um, my, my goal for everybody here is that you really realize there are cements that are well designed, well created, that techniques that are easy to use to make things more predictable for your team, your patients, and it just takes all the headaches out of stuff. And then thankfully, we've got digital technology that helps us involve our patients and make things easier. So, you know, it, it, I can't say it makes dentistry a slam dunk, but it, it makes it a whole lot easier to do things and be successful and really enjoy what you're doing. So, um, I, I truly believe that I've given you some building blocks here. <laughs> And I hope that you're creating your own circumstances, not only in dentistry, but your own lives as we're go going through this struggle on Gilligan's Island all over again. Um, I, my only advice to you is that I know you're stressing out. It's like, oh my God, I can't do this. This is impossible. Uh, what do they say about eating an elephant, right? One bite at a time. Uh, you wanna lose weight. Don't try to run three miles, stand in front of that couch and march in place. Take baby steps and just implement things with your team uh, over time. The most important thing is you implement and when you fall down, you get up and keep learning. So as my dad would say, since I showed my mom before, um, I have to show my dad uh, looking like Tony Soprano there. Uh, don't be a stranger. It's been nice hanging out with you. If you got any questions, by all means, feel free to reach out to me here.